The final speaker today is Charles Young. The title of his talk is Ontogeny and Phylogeny of Recursion Computational Perspective. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm a computer scientist. I deal with numbers. And so this is a computational interpretation of what a lot of things have been said about Tau language and Python language and how to infer something hopefully interesting about the origin uh, of language and how various pieces of core knowledge are put together. Um, this is uncontroversial. Human language is compositional, even late. And no other animals computational systems even have this property. Uh, so there's the idea, of course, the question is how did it emerge? And so one proposal we heard yesterday, either phase of how merge. Well, the other one is more of a gradualistic approach. So that is to identify more transient you know, stages between animal communication, or pseudo-linguistic or semi-linguistic you know, system in transition to language. Um, this is a very common practice, which is the idea of ontogeny recapitulates you know, phylogeny, the idea of biology serves in many forms over centuries. It's also one of the more popular approaches in the gradualistic approach to language Evolution. So I cite some important figures here, including Jim, who said, I take language evolution as the most promising guide to what happened in language evolution. I would agree with that. I wouldn't say that it's the only promising guide. And I think but if we look at some of the arguments made in favor of this recapitulation approach, you see it may not have been as uh, strong as it could be. And you might have to reach different conclusions if you look carefully. So of course, early child language may like the cradles, to the imitations, um, and to unproductive linguistic forms, and also to ape language. So all, all of those arguments can be made. So, so this would be the idea. You have an MGMT to a child that's not particularly linguistically productive, and then gradually transitioning into some other form that's problematic in other ways. Okay. Um, so let's see how we actually make this argument precise. Okay, so in order to make maintain the recapitulation argument, you have to show early child language isn't really quite like adult language. So the direct violation of the continuity of both to language and cognition. So two prominent um, um, features or cases have been put forward. One is um, the, the idea of, of Thomas Ellis in contradiction to a lot of things we've said about child language going back to Roger Brown. That is, the child doesn't have an abstract and productive system of grammar. Usage models. The other one is not viewed as in this domain, but if you think about how language works in general, it, it stands out um, as an oddball. That is in the famous past tense debate. Both sides were arguing um, of the debate agree that the irregular verbs are directly memorized. Now, if you so, therefore, they're not compositionally formed. If you believe in linguistic theory, and they will tell you, and I will see not only the English, not only people saying this, unfortunately, everybody says this that. Irregular verbs that can compositionally form. So if this is true, then therefore you have some coloring example, not only in child language, but also in adult language. So we'd like to deal with that. So um, this is basically going to be evaluation of the arguments that there's some dis discontinuity in early child language and later uh, um, language. And I'll end up with some you know, speculations also on how language is learning mechanisms in terms of computational models and tell us something about acquisition and evolution of language. So here's the basic intuition behind the usage-based idea. Um, that is that to, to equate the use of grammar as some sort of a diversity of expressions that grammar could give you. But here's a concrete measure. As, as, as Sukari said yesterday, determinants of something because they're very early, or almost they never make their mistakes. But if you take a measure of diversity as a ratio, so namely, if you take the total number of nouns that appear with either the and or at or at, and then you take the number of nouns that occur with both. If you take the ratio, you see, so the idea here would be that if your child were to treat those categories abstractly, we combine nouns and added to, uh, and determines freely, you might be expecting a relatively high ratio of diversity of overlap. But if you actually do the count, you see it's only about 20 to 40 percent of it. Okay, so this has led to this is similar to the Rhode Island idea and so on. So this has led usage based folks to conclude that maybe early child language isn't productive. It's a really memorized paired nouns and, uh, and determiners that they simply retrieve from. But a similar um, metric applied to 
mother's language by Batty and colleagues show that actually kids and mothers don't differ in a number of determinant overlap. This may seem you know, puzzling, but it's not puzzling in the fact that the Brown corpus, which is uh, written by professionals, actually have a lower measure of diversity than two year olds. Okay? So the computer would have to be two year olds uh, are more syntactically advanced than professional writers. That seems to be absurd. Okay? So the main idea I want to put forward here is that we can only draw conclusions about our language if the data is shown to be inconsistent, absolutely inconsistent with what a grammar model would, would predict. At the same time, you want to support the usage rate, you have to show a prediction of a usage rate is consistent with the, the actual data of child language. And that hasn't happened. Wait. Uh, can you please, I, I don't explain why this, why O being high is an indication of a more sophisticated syntax. Can you explain? Interchange, interchangeability. So the and A are about as interchangeable in combination. This is what uh, you know, Susan was talking about earlier in the science. It's about as interchangeable of two categories that you can get. Now if the child were treating them as independent you know, combinations of nouns and determiners, the intuition behind this is, it is of course, that you want that value to be high, so virtually every noun is combined with add could also be extended to, to with the. So okay, it's free variation, free variation. You, you really have a productive system. Right, but factually, of course, this rate is not very high. So we'd like to understand why. Why is that higher for kids than, than brown Plus, mass nouns can take the and not up. That's right, but this is only for singular nouns. This is the only kind of singular nouns. And that's the plural nouns. How's the kids supposed to know? Um, uh, they might know, they might not know, but this is not the, 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 the study of, the, of this topic. And actually, if you do this count, the, the plural is actually pretty rare to be in, in the output of children to be actually specifically singular. So here's a case of what's to come. Okay? Um, so give me X is something that has been frequently used as an example of a child as a fixed formulating expression, give me. Okay, and that's uh, actually statistically very dominant. So if you look at uh, Adam even and Sarah, you see that the ratio is about over eight to one to one. Okay, so this is what seems to suggest that give me is indeed a collocation that's not freely created, except when you look at the frequencies of me, him, and her, and you look at a ratio of them, it's almost identical. Okay. So on the basis of this, you would have to say give and pronouns are freely combined. But, but this is what you need to do to accept the proper baseline to validate what's going on. This is already hinting toward where I'm going, which is this law. Okay? And, uh, and I won't go into this, and this law is a near universal uh, statistical uh, distribution law of uh, human language, in particular for high frequency words, top you know, thousands. And this is going to be important here is because if words frequency fall under this law, then you can approximate their frequencies or their probabilities extremely well by using only their rank on, on the list. Okay, this is not important. Okay, so now let's look at what a grammar model would actually predict. So this is a grammar model. This is NP goes to a determiner followed by a noun. Okay? The determiner is either add or the. The noun is a bunch of you know, singular nouns that can go by the way. So let's assume this rule is a completely productive, namely the combination of the two are completely you know, independent. You pick one thing, you can pick the other. To think about this law, this will immediately give you why the rate of overlap is fairly low. If you take a sample of nouns, a lot of them are going to occur only once. If you occur only once, you can't occur only twice. Therefore, you can only pair it with one determiner. Well, the other thing is that even if you have a noun that's occurred of the sample multiple times, there's a still a chance it's paired with one determiner exclusively, just like you toss a player coin three times and they end up with three heads. So now the question is um, actually is even worse than that because the combination of determinant nouns are not fair. I'll give you a trivial example. Okay? The bathroom is a lot more common than a bathroom. No question about it. Most are grammatical. A bath is a lot more common than the bathroom. Most grammatical. Nothing interesting about it linguistically. So if you look at the distribution of words um, and the combination, that's indeed the case. As I said, 75% of singular nouns in brown corpus occur with only one of the determiners. For the 25% that do occur with both, if you add up the favorite versus that you know, the favorite uh, determinant frequency, you get a ratio of almost three to one. So the combination of determinant nouns are actually not balanced at all. Now if you just do this, is also true for child data. The ratio is again counting only those that occur with both, you get a ratio of about 2.5. 
Okay? So this is where this is going. Let's see the bottom of your marbles. Okay, so let's say you have two jars. One has only red you know, marbles of different sizes, the bigger ones have a higher chance of above you. Okay? You have another jar of a green and and uh, and a blue, one you know bigger you know, than the other. Let's say you're drawing the balls out of them independently. You may get something like this. Okay? So this you can the overlap, namely you count the red balls to see how many what the percentage of them occur with both colors. So here's a three out of three. Okay, so this is an independent cross you're drawing from two jars independently. And here's one that's marbles with, with invisible strings. Okay? But let's say if you pick that guy over there, it's always paired here with blue. And pick the other small guy, it's always paired here with green. You also draw some examples. You know, the other guy's fine, but then you, of course, all the medium sized guys are going to be blue, and the other small guys are always you know, going to be green, and so you have overlap ratio of one out of three. Okay, so only the big guy has to appear with both. Colors. So what we have is really this problem. That is that we have a set of observations of the de you know, determined number of pairs. Some of them combined with one term, combined with two. We want to draw this sort of inference to see whether there were you know strings, invisible strings, um, you know connecting some of the balls together. Okay? So that's going to be um, what this equation is doing. I don't like solving equations in, in, in talks, but that's a, that's the key. So that's going to be the probability of the determiner. Multiply the probability of the now. And we assume both of them to be existing, so you can approximate their, their probabilities very efficiently and very you know, accurately by the rank. The fact that you're taking a product means that probabilities are independent. That's the only definition of independence. So here's an example. Again, two determiners. Let's say you have 100 nouns. You draw 200 pairs out of the two. They're completely independent. You can see the most frequent now is virtually 100% of the chance of being sampled. But it drops off very, very quickly. Okay? So this is what we do then. Um, so now we have a specific expectation of what the overlap would be if the combination are fully independent and if the frequencies are in. The second we know to be true. Um, so these are some data. I, this is only available on childhood data where it starts at a very early stage. We can catch the child in the usage-based or item-based uh, you know, stage. The red numbers are computed direct from all these two numbers alone. Okay, that's the that's a, that's a previous you know, slide. So six kids, and also we pool the first 100 tokens of each child, creating a hypothetical child of 600 tokens. So these are the earliest combination of determinants and nouns you have in the public domain. Okay? You basically do a pair test between those two numbers. They're very, very close. Okay? You do test, they don't actually show any difference. <laughs> Now we can probably plot this on the diagram. So the diagonal line would be perfect fit. Our, this is the expected as empirical. If we were physicists, it would be lined up 100%. We're not. But if you do the regression, the slope is 0.98. Not so bad. Okay, so, so that means that actually children are combining determiners and nouns 100% independently. They're merging them. As long as we take the statistical frequencies that are known to be universally true into account. Um, so the the counter would be, of course, well, maybe kids are doing something, um, only giving the appearance of using a grammar. Maybe they're really memorizing everything, and they simply retrieve them from their mem from their memory. So here's a quote: The young children have something they want to say. They sometimes have a set expression readily available, so they simply retrieve the expression from the story and the experience. So to really model this, I extracted. Lots of pairs of determiner and, and, and singular noun pairs in adult data, and then you retrieve them by their frequencies. So the higher frequency will be you know, more likely to be picked. So this will be the mimic the, the effect of child memorizing and retrieving um, these pairs, uh, you know, um, um, as jointly formed pairs, and uh, match the sample size draw you know, many times, go around the color and see what happens. Um, they're actually much below what kids actually. Okay, so to do a slope, it's, uh, it's significantly uh, you know, different from uh, the, you know, the, the empirical values, significantly you know, different from the similar you know, values, and also to do the sense, it's uh, the slope of the point seven point. Okay, so that's really, they're not doing what Thomas Dow is saying. They're saying they're doing. Okay, um, this is interesting, right? Because this is my, the outside of my life you know, as an engineer. 
And this is why Google hasn't solved it, you know, everything. Because Google can store everything, but they haven't solved you know, everything. The reason is that if you look at the, the space of syntactic combinations, it's truly enormous. And the way, the revealing way to show this is to look at the literature known as statistical parsing. You know, I won't bore you with the details. But in those cases, if you have three types of rules, one is a very abstract movie, it goes to the NT. The other is a so-called lexicalized rule. So B goes to drink and P, B goes to eat and P. The third one is that you can lexicalize both the, sub, the verb and the object. Okay? So you can test this, and what you see is basically if you only use a categorical rule of the most abstract type, you cover almost all the data. Okay? And if you actually increasingly um, add lexicalization, you get you know, you know, a little better, but it's not a huge amount. Right? So, so this is probably why um, lexicalization is a technique that's really not popular in computer science because the, the space of combinatorial and coding is simply too large to us to expect anything to occur as drawn in from years. Okay, so um, so that's the interview, and uh, now let's look at NIM. As far as I know, NIM is still the only um, project that made the production data of sign combinations available. So they had to test this. So we made a lot of signs, had a lot of combinations. Initially, it was you know suggested that maybe it was freely you know, combining signs. But later, analysis of, of videotapes that carries and come back with the computer. But tomorrow, to say maybe then was copying um, the teachers. So this is sort of what then the equivalent of determinant non-construction for then. So more would be the, here would be at. Okay, more x give x, so not so surprising is that eat, or eat, give eat, tickle, uh, or tickle, you know, give tickle, and, and so on. So it's clear some of the signs are more dominant than, than, than others, as we might expect. Uh, um, so you basically have eight sign combinations. They're reversible, so kid Nim would say more x, give x, or also x more, x give. The data is from her Terrace's book. Um, by the way, you should watch it for the other documentary. Um, so this would be essentially eight instances of, of rule-like combination. So let's see what NIM does. So we, again, we have a sample size. We have how many distinct um, axes for each you know, construction. We can use the same uh, you know, algebra to show the extended you know, value of uh, overlap. And you see it's actually not productive. In fact, the rate is if it were so. This would show that if NIM were fully using the rules, uh, the combinations interchangeably, it would be over here. But it's actually over here. The wellness code is about 7.4. I mean, I mean, 0.74. So this is actually strikingly similar to the memory-based learner that simply retrieves from the memory of what he had, uh, you know, he has uh, stored. So I think Thomas Edwards theory that works perfectly for Tim's. But not for humans. <laughs> um, and this just shows that the, the, you know, the difference, the dual pair test, you know, the difference between you know, the values, actual values, and the expected you know, values are very different. Okay, so let me change here a little bit. Let's talk about this past tense case. Right? So again, this is something that uh, both sides of the public debate agree, namely irregular work that form by direct association. Um, but if you're a linguist, after you see you're not, you don't need to be a linguist. That's, I think that's, folks engaged in passing the are probably the only one that, do, that believe irregulars are directly memorized. You can look at OED, you can look at second you know, language learning, you can look at Wikipedia. Um, of course, you can look at you know, linguistic literature going back to probably the Pani and certainly the you know, blogs, you know, treatments in the 50s. Uh, this is Wikipedia. Okay, Wikipedia says, you change the vowel to all, and then you add t. And you do so for the following set of words. So these are so-called lexical rules. They don't, they, they don't generalize them, they just apply to a list. But it's still a list. It's still a computation. You compose the stand with the past tense morpheme to generate the output. Right? So that's very different from the, the consensus in the past tense debate. So how do we test this? Um, so this is probably the last past tense uh, to, uh, study to date. We extract pretty much every token out of the Talbot database. We found, for one thing, the over-regular addition rate is about higher than people uh, have reported on, on, on smaller studies. And, and second, 
we just basically listed those rules that are being used to describe um, the lexicalized processes in English irregular past tense formation. And uh, you know why some of the rules are more interesting than others? Because English has a very productive process known about shortening when you add a you know, suffix to it. You've got divine divinity, satire, satiric, bites, bit, as in, as in past tense. At the same time, you have serene, serenity, athlete, athletic, bleed, bled. Okay, so here's another. So, so vowel shortening is not just some arbitrary rule. It's actually a, 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 a regular, sometimes irregular, at least, a, a process that's the town we get a lot of evidence from. So, the prediction here would be that. If you take the word frequency in the input, that will give you an indication of how well kids will learn it. So word frequency has always been the primary sort of evidence for storage basis in the story. Well, you can look at, you can look at rule, you know, frequency, namely the sum of all the frequencies of words that go into a rule. Okay? Because that's what a child is doing. They're not really just learning by you know, direct association. It goes through a rule, then a better rule would make the kid learn it better. Um, so years ago, I uh, did something uh, called the free rider effect. Maybe you control for word you know, frequencies within the same range. Words in a bigger you know, class are learned better. So now we have, that's naturally very similar to the so called stamped you know, frequency effects in processing. Right? So we know seeming and mending are very comparable in their frequency, but seeming is accessed a lot faster than mending because the stamp of seam is a lot faster than mending. So all I'm saying here is that you find effects not only for stamp, but also for suffix. Um, so this is basically what we have right now. We're going into detail. So you do a rank correlation between the uh, input frequency child directed data and how well kids learn them. You see that word frequency alone doesn't do very well. Actually, does the worst out of all the three metrics we're um, three you know, metrics we're do, you know we're doing. The surface rules don't work as well as the abstract rules in the sense of the daily rules that include our short thing. And this is probably more revealing. That is, if you take the the, the irregular verbs. The list group are those that are above average word frequency, but below average rule frequency. Okay, and these are actually above average rule frequency, but below average uh, word frequency. You can see these are actually learned better than these guys by a bunch. Okay, so I don't know how why we do this, but it seems like this is not something we should be doing because there are only 120 you know, you know, irregular verbs in the and why do you bother creating rules for them? Because they're right? Um, then, you know, I think there's some interesting analogy in the you know, categorization kind of literature. So here's a study by, by Doug Manning and, and, and others. They created these creatures. They wanted to sort into two piles. And the interesting feature here would be the second pile. At the bottom, uh, every creature differs from the other one by one attribute. And the other ones, and uh, so, you know, if someone's looking for the overall similarity, they may say, that's a group. And that's the other group, right? And it turned out that this is the only psychology paper, or the only study in psychology that I know that does not report any statistics. Because everybody did the same thing. Namely, everybody did this to call one dimensional story. You pick a dimension, and then you put everything together. Okay? So this is sorted by, by the shape of the head, and some people sorted by the, by, the, by the length of the tail, but nobody went for this overall um, you know, similarity in the metric. Right? So I think there's probably reasons now um, that in learning you have a feature that defines the class name, they share the same phonological change. And you then group words together, you learn together as we, as we have seen um, in the acquisition study. Okay. Um, so to summarize, uh, is the language seems to be compositional. Okay? They're available early on. So the term and non study is about as early as we can get from, from national study, uh, from national production. And you can't help it. Even you only have 120 words, you can memorize them by association. You don't do it, you break it down into you know, compositional classes. And uh, so therefore, we actually see a discontinuity in ontology and philosophy to the extent that we can make anything um, sensible out of NIMS data that it does not seem to, it does seem to be doing what Harris and Weber were saying that it's just simply copying. And, um, and it actually does not even you know, support the gradual emerge, emergence of merge. And finally, of course, the question of how they learn it. Right? You know, not you know, claiming the child is born innately or under some uh, in the words of some of my colleagues, early parameter setting or triggering, somehow instantly you learn the rule. Um, that's not necessarily the case. And I think 
allow me to uh, speculate a bit. I think it goes on to the sort of recapitulation idea again. So, if you know the philosophical literature, you know the pun here. Um, in, a, in a preface of uh, Quine's uh, Words and Objects. Um, so I wrote a couple of books on this, actually directly inspired by John Pierre, you know, by John Pierre which is why I, I bring this up, and also by Dick Lowenton, who taught me uh, mathematical biology, that highlights the learning, well, not learning, but you know, in John Pierre's case, the growth of, of the brain, and the, about, in the biological sense, in, in the Darwinian sense, the variational process, that it's not the, the system that changes directly, is a distribution of variance in the system that you the invariant data. So I wrote some stuff on this, and this is how I did my thesis, and that use learning as you know, selection among the parametric choices of, of syntax. And learning is probabilistic, so you don't do trick, right? You don't have this instantaneous you know, condition. And the transition to target grammars will be gradual. And learning makes mistakes, but when you make a mistake, you're accessing some non target parametric choice within the realm of. Possible grammars, that's of course the note I had going back at least to Jacobson. And finally, learning doesn't take, take place uniformly. Some aspects of grammar are learned earlier than others because for some aspects of grammar, you get more input, more relevance to the input of a particular time when you drive the target value towards, you know, you drive the prime value into a target. And also, the learning seems to be domain general as far as I can tell. So, what I use actually is a simple reinforcement learning model that's used to model inside the in you know, many domains. And um, this is actually very strikingly similar to Bush and Mosgatter's linear learning model back in the 50s. So really bad guy stuff. Talking to a, you know, talking about you know, behavior stuff. So this is this property of probability matching. Um, and that appears to be all over the place. So here's you know famous studies of probability matching with the rat can match the probabilities of the rewards. And so all I'm saying here is that the same learning mechanism, you put in parameters, you put in different replications of the data that's something that humans are doing with your, your, the grammar, and of course, applying a very, very specific domain. Okay, so now I, the, that's the speculation part. The learning must be selection. It's a very good reason to believe all learning is a sum form of selection. This is true from various insights from the theories of, of machine learning, where it came from, and also so inference. Uh, then language must be parameterized in some way. That is that you're making, if you think of this as sort of some dimensionality reduction problem, you're really talking about how to capture all the facts most compactly so the learning can take place most efficiently. And there I think parametric uh, observation of the, of the domain is not a crazy idea at all. And, but you, have, you still have to have merge to make it happen, so I'll stop there.